Okay, so I, in this small uh, lecture that we do today, we review the concept of asymptotic safety, okay? which is a generalization of the concept of asymptotic freedom, which, uh, uh, and uh, so, Which is so. First of all, uh, some wording. So, in uh, field theory, we usually say asymptotic safety. Uh, in the standard RG theory, so in the RG theory, asymptotic safety is also, also called non perturbative renormalization. which is also equivalent to fundamental quantum field theory. Okay. So these three way of saying are exactly synonymous. Okay. And uh, so uh, the very well known example of asymptotic safety is QCD, because QCD is an asymptotic safety theory where uh, the underlying fixed point. Okay, so if you want, we can also put here another line and UV uh, ultraviolet RG renormalization group fixed point. So it's just entirely free, right? Yes. So um, this this are the free way to define the thing. So this is purely from the RG theory. We have a fixed point of the RG transformation which has some particular property, so then we can call it UV, okay? Then we come later to that. This fixed point, uh, when we speak about the synthetic safety, we are implying, and we are implicitly considering the fact that the fixed point is a non-trivial, so it's an interacting fixed point. In the situation where this fixed point is not interacting, is free fixed point, or Gaussian fixed point, <laughs> then we say that the theory is asymptotically free, because it means that at very high energy, a theory which is interacting at low energy, in the limit in which you go to very high energy, the theory becomes non-interacting. Okay? And uh, so in the case in which the fixed point is trivial, Gaussian, okay, then we say speak about asymptotically free theory. QCD is a theory which is asymptotically free. Okay? And since, uh, since it's a theory which is asymptotically free, it is also considered a theory which is a fundamental theory. It's a theory which in principle mathematicians can define in a proper way. Okay. And at the same time, if a theory is fundamental, okay, you can also take the we can take the continuum limit only in the situation where a theory is fundamental. Right? We can take the continuum limit, which is what you usually take on lattice simulation. In lattice simulation you introduce the regularization, okay? And you can do computation on a given scale, which is not the infinite energy scale. But then if the theory has particular properties, and the theory is fundamental, then we can take the continuum limit. Taking the continuum limit means also that the path integral is well defined, if you want. Okay. So basically, these are all different concepts which are completely interlinked together. Okay. From the RG point of view, uh, so a theory which is synthetically safe, so which has an UV fixed point with a finite dimensional critical surface, is a theory which is renormalizable in the non perturbative way. Again, a theory is renormalizable in a perturbative way, this year you have learned in a quantum field theory, when basically um, you have that the divergences that you generate using perturbation theory, which is an expansion around the Gaussian fixed point or such that you can reabsorb them in a finite number of terms in the action. But this happens so, so historically, the development of quantum field theory was, uh, uh, was following the idea that perturbative normalization was a deeper uh, um, a concept, something that we have to take as an axiom, and theory were chosen in that way. QD was chosen as a good theory because it was perturbative and normalizable. Even the standard model with the symmetry baking of the gauge sector was considered 
and accepted by everybody only after uh, Toft and Weltman made gave the proof that the theory was perturbative renormalizable. Today we know that's that's not a, the deep reason why this model is working. The standard model is working because it's an effective theory. Okay, so there are other concepts behind. It. And the only theory which is truly renormalizable in the sense that it's truly a fundamental theory is, for example, QCD, an asymptotically free theory. Or, more generally, a theory which is asymptotically safe. So, the, the concept of asymptotically safe, asymptotic safety is exactly the concept of renormalization in the fundamental way. Because only when we have an asymptotically safe theory, we are able to make prediction at arbitrarily high energy. And by making prediction, I mean that I do an experiment at some energy scale where I fix a certain number of operators, so now coupling constants, and then I'm able to flow them up, okay, without having them explode. Okay, since the coupling constants are like the vertices at the end, okay, if they will explode, it means that an amplitude will explode and will be divergent at some high energy. And uh, so basically, this is the it's important to have this clear because every different, um, let's say, department or in, phys in, the, in high energy physics or uh, people coming from the different kind of approaches will call them in different way. Okay? There are even other two which are more statistical mechanics or probability, which is that you have a, basically a, a scaling law in high energy region. But again, this is just to phrase what we're doing. So what we are trying to do generally in our research project is to find example of synthetic safety theories in four dimension, okay, which if we can, we can also uh, prove uh, with a level of rigor which is proper to mathematics that they really exist. Okay? So now I want to show you a couple of slides that are from some lecture again just this summer, but you know, the LG theory, you know the idea, no? The idea is very, it's very simple, it's very fundamental, that uh, energy scales the couple. So I don't need to understand the uh, uh, classical mechanics, so how to put a satellite in orbit around the Earth. I don't need to understand uh, uh, the standard model, okay? Because if the things were so interwined, in, 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 like entangled, I will never be able to make prediction because I will. So this is basically the, the picture in this picture that depending on the resolution that I use to probe the physical system, I see physics which is different. And especially, this means that when I describe a theory uh, which, is, uh, which has a fundamental cutoff A, which is equal to lambda equal to 1 over A, okay, I need to consider certain degrees of freedom. When I change the scale, for example, something which is mediated by boson, for example, this is the classical case of the electric theory. You know? If I have enough energy to see the bosons here, okay, and this, this separation is the inverse of the mass, okay, so 1 over m. So when this is comparable like this, so when my cutoff is comparable to the mass, for example, of the particle, I will have to consider this cut. At low energy, I can just consider the Fermi theory, which has a fourth for Fermi interaction. This is basically telling me that uh, what I have to consider when I do physics is I consider a flow where I have action at every different scale. And depending on the scale of the problem that I look, I will have to change that. This is the RG flow. Okay. So with this idea, then I know that the only thing that will constrain the form of this action, and this is a functional, okay? So this is an S of a set of fields. So it's a functional. It takes a field and gives me a number. Okay. So uh, the, now I know that even if the, the uh, at this scale, the action is very simple. It has just a couple of coupling constants, for example. At the next order, the other one will be generally generated. Okay? Because in general, fluctuation will generate all possible couplings. So it means that it, it's uh, by no way I can avoid this thing. And I, I should start from the beginning to consider that, okay, in general, my action, which is the effective action, will be a point in the theory of, of all possible actions that I call theory space. And every point here is an action which is consistent with the symmetries. Okay? So at the end, this is even more logical. If I actually describe the phenomena, what do I need? I need a group of the symmetries. I need my degrees of freedom, so the statistics. There's spin 1, spin 1 half, and so on. Okay? And basically, I need the dimensionality of space. 
these are the three, the set of data that defines a Curie space. Okay? And then I know that if I have to describe any phenomena, uh, my theory, which will work at that scale, will be somewhere inside there. But to really start understanding, uh, so it seems, defining this way seems a general and abstract problem that I cannot solve. But luckily, theory space has a lot of structure. Okay? And in fact, there are some theories, which are the fixed points of the AG transformation, okay? that are so special, that are basically also scale invariant. Okay? It means that if for some reason this object here is equal to my fixed point theory, I do an AG transformation and I stay there. It's a place where the theory is scaling via. So, fixed points are a property of that set of data. Once I specify this set of data, okay, I already got those theories. So, before even starting, I don't, I don't even need to write down a theory. I mean, you know, when the Max, before this idea, you were Maxwell, and Maxwell was writing down a set of equations. So he was speaking a Lagrangian. Einstein was speaking a Lagrangian. But now we don't pick any more Lagrangians, basically, because the Lagrangians are given. Okay? So these fixed points okay, <coughs> are the fixed points, are G fixed points that we have here. Okay? The fixed point can be of two different sorts, UV, infrared, or a mixer, generally mixer. This comes later because we need to study how is the flow around them. The important thing about this theory is that, for example, uh, they are generally conformal invariant theories. Okay? So under certain assumptions, which for example unitarity, in many dimensions we now have a proof that tells you if, it, if a, a fixed point is also a conformal theory. Because basically the idea that if this theory is invariant under rotation, translation, and scale transformation, in two dimensions, for example, this implies, if the theory is unitary, that uh, the theory is also conformal invariant. So it has a wider symmetry. And this symmetry is enough to completely construct the theory without ever speaking about the Lagrangian, for example. And in fact, the theory here is all defined by the conformal data. Okay? I don't need to do a path integral. I don't even need to do quantization. This is not the infrared theory of a microscopic one, or it's not the UV theory of a standard model. That's really a theory which is there. Okay? And those are those fundamental quantum field theory, basically. Okay? Depending on if they will be the end point of the flow, because now if I am here, I can flow to this one when I go to high energy, then it will be continuum limit, asymptotic safety, non perturbative RG, renormalization, fundamental theory, path integral well defined. Okay? Or otherwise, thing that we will not discuss today, but this was the setting where this idea came up first was if this point is the infrared of my flow. Then this one governs phase transition, the phenomenon of universality. Basically, the idea that since basically uh, you can imagine like this. So I have an action, and I usually have something like this, no? And then I integrate over the field. But this quantity here is nothing than just a probability distribution. Okay. So when I I do this is a way to account for fluctuation, okay? And I, it happens that even if the random variables, this you consider them as random variables, you, you don't know the statistics, you don't know their action, for example, the, the low energy one, the microscopic one, for example. When, for example, in this case, we go to the low energy, so in the infrared, if a fixed one like this one is a basin of attraction of many of them, it means that the theory here and the theory here will have the same long-range physics, okay? And this is the phenomenon of universality. This is, explains why, for example, if you look at a transition between water and vapor or uh, ferromagnet, uh, going from the paramagnetic to the ferromagnetic phase, this completely different system, they have the same scaling law describing their phase transition. So for example, something like a specific heat we have a power law which is exactly the same independently of a lot of microscopic details. So this is the other phase of a fixed point. This is the infrared phase, phase and this is the UV phase with all the things. Okay? Today we're interested in the UV phase because we want to find which theories are fundamental. Okay? So this is already... Uh, <coughs> you know, 
now we are saying something very strong that you give me the symmetry, the degrees of freedom and the dimensionality and if there is a fundamental theory, theory which I can call fundamental okay, then it must be already inside somewhere encoded in that information right? and what we want to do is to find this this is a kind of treasure hunt you know? those are very particular perfect action that we want to find because they have very important properties the next step is that, okay, now let's look at the RG flow around the fixed point. So we do the linearized RG flow. So we take a fixed point, and obviously this is an infinite dimensional space because it's a functional space. So this is a linear space around it. And uh, it turns out, and this is one of the most important uh, reasons why the RG is very, uh, also works at the quantitative level, is that the linearized RG transformation encodes all the conformal data, basically. So the, the linear RG transformation can be seen as a big matrix. And when I diagonalize this matrix, all the eigenvalues have this physical uh, meaning. They are the critical exponent, for example. They are the, the structure constants. They are universal ratio and so on. Okay. So, so uh, sorry, uh, which matrix? Like when you do a transformation yes. of the parameters? When, uh, yes. The RG, so here I am always working with an RG transformation okay, mm -hmm. that we have not yet constructed because what we are seeing here applies to every uh, formulation of the RG. Okay? Mm -hmm. then, uh, uh, so now we are working at the conceptual level, then later we go to so the technical level and find a real implementation. But then, from this operator we can construct a linear operator, which is the first derivative of this one. But since this is an operator that works in a functional space, this is the linear operator. The spectrum of this linear operator contains all that information. So if you know the spectrum arbitrarily well, then you can find the universal quantities like critical exponent, universal ratio, scaling functions. You can find uh, uh, even the structure constants. So you can reconstruct the conformal thing to you. And then depending on the sign that the eigenvalue have, you will distinguish between relevant and irrelevant direction. Even more importantly, the basic question is which one is the dimensionality of the field? So usually we answer to this question with a canonical analysis. We say this is a scalar field, it has dimension of like mass to power b half minus 1. And this is the engineering dimension, which implicitly is assuming that you're working with the linearized operator of the Gaussian fixed point. Away from the Gaussian fixed point, you don't know the spectrum. The spectrum is a property that is a function of that data that we put there. And in fact, usually we parameterize this by putting eta half. Plus eta half there, okay? And this is actually what we call a scaling dimension, and a priori we don't know it. This is something that we do computation to find. But it's a property of the linearized operator around the given fixed point. And uh, then usually the area around here, okay, you can imagine that, okay, we know these theories, and usually we can uh, solve exactly these theories. For example, the fact that we can solve exactly the Gaussian theory the free theory, allows us to do the perturbation theory around that. Because, so, knowing, if I know this, this is the Gaussian theory, okay? Then I can compute the correlator, exactly. I can compute three correlators, exactly, and so on. I can solve exactly the theory. So now, if I want, now I can, uh, I have a procedure to uh, uncover what is around this fixed point in a perturbative way. Because, for example, if now I go with an action which is the Gaussian action, plus lambda and there I put an operator, then I go like this, then I go the minus, then I do my fat integral, okay? Then obviously this operator is a function of, of the value speed. So when I expand this more lambda, this is just becoming a lot of these objects that I know. So I can do computations. And I can do this also for a, an interacting theory if this is a conformal theory, because I know how to compute in it all these objects. Okay. So this first of all shows you that all these things which are in the linear area, in principle you can try to compute them if you know how to solve the, the, the fixed point theory in a perturbative way. Okay. And this is exactly what we do when you do perturbation theory in this case. Now, so this is the linear but in principle, we would like to know the RG theory arbitrarily far away from a fixed point. Right? We would like to know all the RG flow. We would like to have a technical implementation where we are able to do that. 
uh, basically here uh, <coughs> there are basically two techniques that allow you to say something exact uh, arbitrarily far away from a fixed point okay and these are the CNA theorem okay which for example lead us to very important results like you have the so there is there are some general CNA theorem which also develop in a more general theory which is called the by consistent theory, consistency relation and so on. They are telling us for example that if I take the beta function with a uh, something like this. Yeah? For example, it's telling us that uh, every wave here, okay, so then, okay, you know what is a beta function. A beta function is telling you, I define t like log u, which is the scale of the lambda, which is a reference scale, okay. And then I take a derivative of my coupling with respect to this, and this defines the beta function with the lower index. Then I can define a concept of a beta function with a higher index. This is a flow, okay? In my theory space, this is giving in every point a flow, and then I construct the streamline. Those that I depict there are the streamlines, okay? So now, imagine that you have a flow which is well defined. Then, for example, it is possible to prove from general principles that the flow must satisfy this kind of condition in certain uh, approximation, okay? So this is. C theorem and theorem, which usually we are able to construct them in two, four, six dimensions, or kind of statements that are valid everywhere. The other kind of statements that are valid everywhere is the exact flow. There is a way to construct the transformation R in a way which doesn't depend on perturbation theory around the Gaussian or any other fixed point. That's another, another parameter that I can tell you the story another time. What we want to do today, because now we want to go to, to this particular paper that we want, we want to work around. We will use the tool of perturbation theory around the Gaussian fixed point, but we are trying to see if we can find a situation where, so this is the Gaussian fixed point, and here there is another fixed point, so non-Gaussian, uh, uh, okay? We, we want to hope that there is a particular situation where this fixed point is under the reach of the perturbation theory constructed around the Gaussian. This is the technical tool, okay? So these things that we were just saying now, they are all general, they are uh, true everywhere. But now since we are limited by the fact that um, these techniques are still in their infancy, let's say, they're still we're just starting now to really develop, we will start to use the standard technique, which is perturbation of theory around here. But we hope to be able to see at least one fixed point which has the property for, of being asymptotic safe, but which is also controllable. Okay? Okay. So this is the first part. Stop. Oh, no, I'm actually needed in a moment, by the way. Okay. So, now obviously the first question you can ask yourself is, do we have any example of theories which are asymptotically safe? Okay. And um, what is an asymptotically safe theory? So it's a fixed point, okay, which is attractive in the UV, which is attractive in the UV, okay, but that is attractive in the UV not in all directions. Now we will, with, uh, with the example of today, we will really see in detail what it means. But now, here we have an infinite dimensional theory space. Okay, so that's the real case. Now we project, we take an infinite dimensional space and we make it just one dimension. So we are basically saying that our action, that depends on the scale mu, okay, and of my field, is just equal to one coupling and a given operator. So I'm dropping all the other one, okay? So the transformation R just becomes the beta function. Okay? 
and the data function, I can uh, even draw it in this, so I can just represent the flow in this way. So this is my data function, and for example, okay, this is my Gaussian pixel point. Okay, so let's work with the coupling, which must be positive, for example, like in the gauge case. So then, I, you know, I can uh, obviously have many cases. The beta function can be like this, can be like this, can be like this, or can be like this. There are various situations, okay? For example, uh, okay, we can even call alpha this one to be consistent with the beta. So. Okay. So the, the first case that usually you examine, so basically all known examples can be reduced to, I mean, not all known examples, but uh, the example that are discussed here in this paper, they are all of this form. Okay? So we are working in a very simple situation now. We are basically using perturbation theory or the large NX function to compute these things. And the beta function has this form, so it's a polynomial. Okay, and it has usually two coefficients. And usually there is one coefficient which comes from uh, dimensional reasons, because if the coupling has a dimensionality, I always have to work with the dimensional aspects. Okay. And uh, obviously, if now I look, I, I look for a fixed point, a fixed point when I am at the level of beta function is specified by this simple condition. And if I apply it here, I find that there is alpha Gaussian, which is just zero, and then there is alpha non-Gaussian, Okay, which is A over B. Okay. Now, depending on the sign of A and B, I will be in one of these cases. Okay, so uh, so the, the the standard case of uh, gauge theory. Okay, so now we are in four dimension. We have. Uh, a group which is S U N, okay, in the adjoint representation, N is gauged, okay. So if you want, then this is in the order. So this is G, and then our degrees of freedom is like our field is like a set of fields like a new, and then we have two goes. If you want, we're working with a further bubble, for example, and uh, and some fermions. I also have flower indices. So this is, for example, the set of things that we have. And dimension is equal to 4. Okay. So this is the theory space that you consider when you do uh, P, uh, QCD. Okay? And then this is n color. And A goes between 1 and, and F. So once we specify the space, in principle, uh, So in principle, we are able to do all these kind of constructions. Okay? Now, um, the problem is that this is technically difficult. If you come out with a way to construct exactly the R operation for a given theory, then that's a great achievement. That's the reason why exact flows are interesting. In any case, what is found in this case is that the beta function has this shape. Okay? So in, that, in this case that we're considering here, A is equal to 0, and B, okay, is a positive number. It is written like that. So this is the A and B which come out from this set of data. Okay. So in this case, if I am, uh, if now I take my coupling here at some scale, okay, I will flow in this direction. So I will reach the Gaussian fixed point in the UV. Okay. It's easy to see that. That is happening because now you just do the simple standard analysis. So if we have that the key alpha is equal to beta of alpha, then let's take alpha equal to the fixed point value plus a small modification. We want to check the stability of the fixed point. So then if you do t derivative, this one doesn't uh, doesn't flow. And then I want to expand this one. So I will write like alpha star plus delta alpha, beta 
the alpha evaluated at the start plus four orders of delta alpha squared. Okay? Obviously, this one is equal to zero the pixel points. So this is the linearized transformation. We call this thing lambda or theta. In the paper, it's called theta, but sometimes I call it theta. So from this thing here, we see that the alpha is equal to theta the alpha. So we have that theta the alpha, delta alpha, and theta. Which tells me that delta alpha at the scale nu is equal to delta alpha at the scale lambda, which is my reference scale, p, p, theta. And now you remember that, so this is just a constant. And this t is the logarithm of mu over lambda. So this is mu over lambda, and this is theta. Okay. So now you see that depending on the sign, so if this is bigger than, uh, if this is smaller than zero, okay. So now you are very, you want to go a high energy, okay. So mu is bigger than your reference scale. Okay. So this quantity is bigger than one. So if since this is smaller, if we are in the case that this is smaller than zero, then you have that alpha reaches alpha z alpha star when mu goes to infinity. Okay. So in this case, you see that the condition for the fixed point to be UV attractive when I go when I go to very high energy is that the eigenvalue is negative. Okay. So the eigenvalue is just the the derivative of the of the beta function evaluated at the fixed point, <coughs> and for our kind of beta function that we have there, this is equal to minus a. Because when you do the derivative there, you have a, and then uh, for example in the Gaussian case, no. So it's minus a at the non-Gaussian fixed point, and it's equal to oh. non-Gaussian Gaussian is equal to h. This is just the, the, the complete formal way to say that the, the tangent here, if the tangent is negative, this is attractive in UV. If the tangent is positive, it's repulsive in UV, is attractive in the infrared. Okay, so this is the case of QCD. For example, if what happens now if we consider QCD in uh, four plus epsilon dimension? For example, in five dimensions. Okay. So in five dimension, it happens that uh, so basically we are just changing this, okay. just change this information, and now we will find something like this. Okay, because basically. Uh, so in, in our case, alpha was equal to 0, b was bigger than 0. So if now I uh, go in dimension d equal to 4 plus epsilon, a will be basically equal to epsilon. Because when you have a beta function like this, the linear time is the dimension of the, of the field. And this is what comes from the quantum correction, if you want. So in dimension slightly greater than 4, this is a small slope like this, so the beta function will just go up and then will turn down because then this one will be dominant again. So now the picture is changed. So if you're in five dimension, this is infrared because we saw the slope is positive, and this is in the UV one. So in this case, you can have a theory which has a finite UV limit, okay? Because it's asymptotically safe here, so here the theory is asymptotically safe. Because this is my running coupling. No? So imagine that I measure my coupling here. This is an experiment, a certain scale mu. Then if I want to go to scales which are much higher, for example, for example, imagine the amplitude. No? The amplitude at the end will be proportional to alpha at the scale mu where I'm measuring this thing. Plus momentum and so on. Okay? Just imagine what happens if now when I send mu to infinity, if this quantity 
pose to him in the amplitude of this not well defined. The theory is not a normalized one. But if this goes to a well, a well defined limit, then the amplitude is well defined, basically. So it means that here I have a theory which I, I, if I go to very high energy, the theory goes to this point, so where this one becomes my fixed point. And so it goes that at very, in the high energy regime, the theory behaves like a non trivial interacting theory. So that's my continuum limit, my non trivial UV theory. It's the UV completion. That's my fundamental theory. Okay. While when I go in the infrared, then I go in this case to a weak coupling regime. While if I am on the other side, and I go, so if I go to the UV, to the, so remember arrows always go from UV to infrared. Right? This is the convention. So in this way, I go, you see, in the infrared to a strongly interacting theory. So I have a well defined UV limit, and this one has even a strongly interacting low energy. Okay? Like in standard QCD, no? In standard QCD, we had. We have a strongly interacting low energy, a very simple high energy. Here are gluons are free, while here I have P meson, B, and all this mess. Okay. So another possible example is uh, so of asymptotic safety. The first possible example of asymptotic safety, which is not just asymptotic freedom, is this case of gauge theories in five dimensions. But there is a, there are other options. Another option is uh, D, so D equal to degrees of freedom, I have a metric, the, the corresponding rows, okay. and my group is the same of physics. Okay. So in this case, I'm speaking about gravity, and gravity in two dimensions is asymptotically free, has a coupling that is exactly like gauge theories in four dimensions. Now, if I go in d plus epsilon, in 2 plus epsilon dimension, the beta function does exactly the same. So gravity is, is asymptotically safe in this fixed point. The key question is, what happens when epsilon is equal to 2? Is gravity asymptotically safe in 4 dimension? And uh, here I can open a huge page, but we can, if you're interested in this problem, I have studied this problem. There is evidence that gravity can be asymptotically safe in 4 dimension. Okay. And um, but that's a bigger page uh, that we don't do. But this is another example. Then there is another example which is known, which is the one of uh, gross nouveau theories in two or three dimensions. In three dimension, for example, a gross nouveau theory is a, an example of a synthetically safe theory. So in this case is three dimension and the, the, the gauge group, the, the global groups depend on the, on the realization that uh, these are very simple, so for example, you put them and I think, or S or N, a certain group G, and here you have fermions. This is a known example of an asymptotic safety theory. <coughs> Then the example of gluon we already discussed. Why, for example, the example of scalar uh, is different because scalar theories. So let's take, for example, group zeta 2. We just take a scalar theory here and we consider it in four dimensions. Now we have the opposite with respect to asymptotic freedom. We have a beta function which is like this. So this is a theory which um, has this one as an infrared fixed point, okay? While if I try to go to the V, this one explodes, and this is what we call the Landau pole, okay? So, um, scalar theories in four dimension have only the Gaussian fixed points in general, and this is an infrared fixed point. While if I go in three dimension, where this is very interesting for statistical mechanics, then I have this kind of beta function. So now I have an infrared fixed point here, which is non-trivial. And this is the fixed point which I used to describe phase transition and so on. Okay? And here I can also put other kind of groups. And here I can work in dimensions between uh, so V that is like from 2 to 3. They have non-trivial things. Actually, in every dimension between 
2 and 4, there is a lot of non-trivial things happening. A lot of non-trivial fixed points, beta functions are very complicated in this regime. While for uh, D bigger than 4, I have only the Gaussian fixed point. OK, so this is just a, a small uh, atlas of what is known. Okay? But in principle, our goal for uh, when we study strongly interacting theories, or in general quantum field theory, is to make an atlas where we specify these ingredients and we want to know all the possible fixed points because once we know them, we know which theory can be constructed, which phase transition occurs, which kind of symmetry breaking happens, and all these kind of things. And uh, in fact, there are two kinds of fixed points, infrared or UV. The UV one are interesting for high energy physics. They are a fundamental theory. Since, and that's the reason why we're interested in them. Okay. So, this is like something which is like explained. You can also, f so this small part of the atlas is uh, the first part of the paper. I just added a couple of things. You can just, uh, if you want, just take the various beta functions and just draw them, just to remember what the limit of the thing is. Okay, now, in, uh, now we, we study the system that uh, Francesco and Daniel studied. So what they did was just take, we have the paper with you, uh, you know. Uh, basically, they, they find out this system which is composed of equation 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Do you have it? Just watch it together. Um, so you may ask yourself, why did they study this system? Okay. So that now we now now we are go, going more in our quest. So our quest is to find fixed points, which are UV fixed points, in theories in four dimension. Okay. So we, we know we can play with the gauge group, or which can be the group can be now uh, a product of groups and it can act uh, in a gauged way or in a global way. And now we know we can also choose a different mix of gauge of degrees of freedom. We have spin one, spin zero, and spin one half. Usually we play with these. So basically, uh, the nice thing when you have flavors and gauge groups, like in gluons, is that then you have two free parameters, which is the number of colors and the number of flavors. When you have this capital N, you know, one very useful technique which complements very well with perturbation theory is the large N. In the large N, things become more, more simple, usually. So it's strange. You take very uh, high number of particles, but the theory is simpler than with a small number. Basically, this is because there is a kind of uh, law, law of large numbers or something like that, you know, a central limit theorem happening. So we start from a gauge theory that we know it has a, uh, is asymptotically free in four dimensions, so it's equation nine. And then, obviously, we know that the only way to make a, a pure gauge theory asymptotically safe is to change the dimension. So to make that A be proportional at, at, at uh, D minus 4. But we want to work in 4. So that's, if we want to do something more, we need to add fermions. Okay? Yeah, but fermions alone would not change anything. Okay? And uh, then obviously we need to add another kind of interaction. And this is the Yukawa interaction. Okay? Because you know, notice here that we are considering all couplings which uh, are dimensionless in fourth dimension. Okay? This is because we want to also use perturbation theory in a straightforward way. And then the problem is that once you introduce the Yukawa coupling, then obviously you're forced to put a cinetic term for the scalar field and the self-interaction. Because if you don't put them, then this is the reasoning we were doing before, you have an action S, even if at one scale they are zero, they will be generated at the next scale. So you have forces to put them on. So you end up with the space with the five cup, four cuttings. Then uh, you prepare yourself for studying the system when the number of colors and uh, fer the fermions of flavors is very big, so you rescale the couplings in order that you will be able to take the large end limit which in this case would be the Veneziano limit, which means that you're taking the number of color to infinity, the number of flavors to infinity, in such a way that their ratio is, uh, is controlled. It's a fixed number. And in particular, here the epsilon 
will be the number of uh, flavors over the number of colors minus this number here. And this is explicitly chosen, okay, so that if epsilon is equal to zero, so if epsilon is, say, uh, we have, so the, the case is if epsilon is uh, bigger, smaller than zero, we are asymptotic freedom. And so we study the other situation where we hope to find asymptotic safety, okay? And now we will see that, in fact, we will find asymptotic safety. So, um, at this point, then, <coughs> uh, we have the, the four couplings that we said, that are J, Y, U, and V, that lead us to define alpha J, G, alpha Y, alpha U, and alpha B. So our theory space is parameterized by these couplings. Okay. So then we can write down the in principle if we had the full beta function, we would be extremely happy. If we had the full beta function, we would be extremely happy. But as we said, we, we cannot. And so what we do is to do a perturbation around the Gaussian fixed point. Because if you look at that action, if in that action you put the coupling is equal to zero, you're left with a Gaussian action, which has a cinetic term, cinetic term for the for the um, these fields here, okay, which there are two combinations. This and the other combination and a term like this for the and then a term like this for the quartz. So in the limit where this are equal to zero, I have the Gaussian action. So this is telling me that I'm expanding around the Gaussian action and I'm looking for the non-Gaussian pixel point inside here. So then the technique that I use is perturbation theory. So now you know perturbation is theory is very well developed. So we have the ability of computing this beta function to various order, and here is the loop order. So we compute them in the various order. And then we add the other information, which is the one of the vial consistency condition. So we take advantage of the fact that we know that the full flow, if we knew it ex uh, uh, particularly well, will satisfy those relations between the beta function that we saw. Since we want, since we're making approximation, we want to make the approximation which is mo the, most, the more consistent we can with the, the, the Y consistency condition. And so that thing will tell us that basically, uh, basically, it, it, if, if I want to satisfy that, I realize that I have to consider the various beta function at different orders in perturbation theory. So my um, a perturbative approach is not exactly the perturbative one. Because I, I take, for example, uh, if I take this one at one loop, I take this one at zero loop, this one at zero loop, and this one at zero loop. If I take this one at two loop, I take one, this one at one loop, this is zero loop, and this is zero loop. If I take this one, take three, two, one, and one. There's this particular kind of gradient. Okay? So we work like this, and this is I call it the leading order, next to leading order. And this is next to next to leading order. Basically, the leading order is the one that we just studied here. Because the leading order is only this beta function. And in fact, it will, will be exactly the case where we have an A and a B. Okay? And, uh, but now A is proportional to this epsilon, which is not D minus 4, but is this epsilon here. Yeah. Okay? And, um, can I ask uh, yes. maybe, maybe a stupid question? Uh, is there not uh, a different Yukawa for each uh, flavor of fermion? Uh, but in this case, it's, it's, it's taken as one. Huh? It's yeah. basically because you, you impose a couple of uh, global symmetries as well. Yes. Oh, yeah. Not mentioned in the paper, actually, but yeah. there is a, an SUN symmetry for each of the flavors. But in print, they all each have yeah. the same problem. Basically. You, you could imagine that situation, mm -hmm. but when the, you impose global symmetry so that you don't need to. Mm -hmm. And it would be the same for the scalars. If you didn't have this uh, big global yeah, symmetry, yeah. you would have a humongous amount of, of coverage. And we 
be able to compute anything. Okay, so now this one we have already seen. Now let's focus a moment on this one, just to see how the, the, the general description we made before boils down in this approximation. Okay. So in this case, uh, the beta function have this form here. Okay. And uh, now, and you see that epsilon comes, which is exactly that kind of uh, quantity there. So I have the beta function for the alpha g and a beta function for alpha lambda. So I just plug them in. There's so nothing. So now, uh, when we so when we will try to so up to now was the general discussion. So now we just speak a moment of what we do when we do a new project. Okay. So now when we decide that we have a new model. So again, g, e, and b. No? We have these quantities here. We will decide this because we think that may be an interesting system to study. This one will lead to a set of beta functions, E in a certain set uh, I, which is the set of invariants that I consider, which is my subspace of theory space, because otherwise theory space will be infinite. Right? And then we have a set of beta functions that we want to study. So obviously, the things you do are very simple. The first one is to write down the beta functions. And uh, then we look for fixed points. So now imagine that we want to solve this. So when we set this thing equal to zero, so is this quantity equal to zero and this quantity is equal to zero. So now you see that here you can do a very simple thing. So obviously you see from here that there is a Gaussian fixed point. Because this are equal to zero, that's a solution. But if this is different from zero, then you know that if there is a solution alpha y, Will, can be written in terms of g alpha j in this way, yeah? exactly. So now I can take the beta function of alpha j and substitute of alpha y inside, and I get this quantity here. So this is my beta function okay, of uh, one coupling alone, j, uh, alpha j, one side eliminated at the fixed point alpha y. This is nice because now if I plot this quantity here, I find this thing here. And uh, this is obviously shows you which of the cases that we were considering before. No? We're in the case where theory does like this. And, uh, but in any case, in this case, it's still very easy to solve everything here. And you can solve and you find uh, the Gaussian fixed point, and this is the non Gaussian fixed point. So here we define the Gaussian one and the non Gaussian one, and we also make an expansion in epsilon to see because we know that our setup is guaranteed in the sense it's well controlled when we take this Venetian limit and we take that epsilon very small. So you see that you can expand this as an epsilon if you want, you can just consider the first order. Okay? So basically this thing here tells us that we have the Gaussian fixed point which is equal to uh, which is alpha. So we start zero, and this is the non Gaussian, which it's a number. So let's say that to order epsilon, this is 26 over 57 epsilon, and this is 4 over 19 epsilon. But, but is, this, is this truly non Gaussian? Because in the physical theory, you would let epsilon go to zero anyway, right? Uh, no, we will take the limit here such that this quantity is not zero. Uh -huh, but we, but, but it's, it's, still, uh, it's still the, the space-time dimension. Yeah, but we are working in four dimension. Epsilon is not the space-time dimension. Okay, here. okay. Uh, so, yes, this is another epsilon. This is the epsilon is this quantity here. Okay. okay? okay. We are, as we said, there are two situations. Mm -hmm. To have an, an, a non-zero A in the beta function. So beta G equal A G minus, so let's say alpha minus g alpha square. So we have an Andrea fixed point only when this term is here. We have two roles for doing that. One is to change dimension. And in that case, alpha will be equal to b minus 4. Mm -hmm. Or otherwise, uh, we can do this kind of, of operation. Okay. So here we are strictly in 4, but we change the number 
we have a number of flavor and color to go in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. such a way that this quantity is slightly bigger than this. I see, I see. That's the, the, what makes this fixed point uh, controllable okay, in the perturbative scheme. So every time we do something, then this epsilon is really there in 4D. Okay? So this is not the epsilon expansion. Okay, and uh, then once we have found the fixed points, we want to know if these fixed points are UV or infrared, or in any case they will be mixed, they will have some UV direction and some infrared direction. Actually, to have asymptotic safety, I need to have both infrared direction and UV directions. Because an asymptotically safety theory is a theory which has an UV critical surface which is finite dimensional. Because the parameters on the surface are my three parameters that I have to take from experiment. And all the other one, infinitely many other one, will be, in this case, infrared direction. Okay? Because, but at the end, we make a nice picture. So, now the next step is to just redo this analysis here, but with more couplings. Okay? So now imagine that we have... Uh, So um, I define, I can write my alpha. So now let's make a vector of alphas, which are those four alpha there, okay? But this is in general in any, in any dimension. Now. Then I can write alpha like the star plus a delta alpha. So my beta function become a beta function, and here is beta function for the, for the difference. And this, again, the beta function vector evaluated at the fixed point, and here I have <coughs> a matrix acting on alpha, and this matrix is such that m j is equal to u beta i on u j j at the fixed point. So this is the stability. So now, what I'm interested in, and this is the famous linear operator. Right? It's the linearized operator we were speaking before, in this embodiment. Okay. So the stability matrix will have eight values. So this so stability matrix, now I can just compute it at my beta function, and it becomes this expression here. So this is the general stability matrix. Now I can evaluate the stability matrix at a fixed point. If I evaluate the stability matrix at the Gaussian fixed point, I find all zeros because it's a Gaussian fixed point. And so uh, I, now go to, I need to go to the next order to see the direction is attractive or not in this case. But then in this case, I'm much more interested in the non-Gaussian fixed point. So I take the, the stability matrix, I evaluate it at the non-Gaussian fixed point, and it gives me this quantity. So this is, but then I want to take the eigenvalues. There will be two eigenvalues, theta 1 and theta 2. And they are this quantity. They come out, and then you see theta 1, then I can make a simple, uh, make a series in epsilon, because you know I'm always interested in controlling it. So this is how it's theta 1. So it starts with a minus, and while this one starts with a plus. So one eigenvalue is negative, and one is positive. Okay. So basically what I really find important is that theta 1 is minus and theta 2 is bigger than 0. This is telling me that my non-trivial fixed point will have uh, two directions, okay, which are the, along the a direction of the matrix M. And in one direction, okay, so when it's negative, I am attracted in the UV. Okay, so This goes in the end, so this is infrared and this is UV along here, while in the other direction is the contrary. Okay. So this is the direction, one, let's call it 1, and this is the direction 2. Okay. And you can check also, for example, with a, we will work with the value of epsilon 0 0.05. And you see 1, this is theta 2, and this is theta 1. 
So this is very important because only now that I made the eigenvalue analysis, the stability analysis, I can declare asymptotic safety. Because I have a newly fixed point, which has a critical surface, which is this basically the flow that goes out from this direction. Okay? This is my UV critical surface. Because if I am here, some scale, when I go to infinite, infinitely high energy scale, I go to the fixed point. So this is a trajectory which is well-defined in UV. So if I have a theory around here, I will have a well-defined continuum limit and all those words we were saying before. So now we have an example. Our theory defined by that group, those degrees of freedom, in that dimensionality, in the particular limit that we are considering, okay, which is that. This, this theory is asymptotically safe. And, and what's your argument that if the other direction had, had the same feature, then... Uh, if, the, if they're the both, theory. then it's not predictive. Because no, I mean, then, then every, every theory will, will reach the theory. Yes, then they are all asymptotically safe. But if, I have, if everything is asymptotically safe, then I'm not able to make predictions. Because then I will need to specify an infinite number. Any point will be good. Okay? While I want to have only a, a theory, I want only a finite set of parameters I have to measure from mm -hmm. the experiment. From the experiment, you know, I need to put myself here. Okay. So if I'm able to put myself here, I'm able to make prediction of the reality. So if you establish one direction, you can predict the other. Yes, place. exactly. That doesn't have any significance that the one, one eigenvalue is much, much larger than the other in the absolute magnitude. Yeah, it's, this is represented by this plot here. No? So now I just made a plot. Uh, you know, you see these lines are almost vertical here. But okay, then you can escape. I mean, um, yeah, in this case it happens. Again, values of the stability matrix or real physical quantities, they do not depend on the scheme. Okay? So then, um, as we said, this operation R has a lot of freedom, arbitrarily, because it's the way in which you explain how you change degrees of freedom, you know? So imagine that we are, remember, cross-graining is like you're observing uh, just, I mean, when you look at the, the tree, you see a green thing, okay? But then if I look closer, I see the, the leaves, and if I look even closer, I see the cells. The way in which my course grain is different from yours, okay? One can have a better sight, and so I have an energy transformation which is different from yours. And when I, you know, when I go away like this, if I reach a fixed point, it means that the tree will reach a perfect shape. Or, uh, or a particular scale invariant thing. Okay. So there is a lot of uh, arbitrarity, but things like the critical exponent do not depend on this. So the fact of a fixed point of being asymptotically sick do not depend. And these are real quantity which actually dictate how physical quantity will scale at the fixed point. In any case, now we have the, the full picture. So now we can make a very... <coughs> So this picture has, so this is alpha g, and this is alpha y. So this is the Gaussian fixed point. Um, I don't know your lines on the yes. plot. Are, they this, are you using the same convention? No, my lines are, the, the, here the arrows are flipped because um, oh, okay. I, t, so t is equal to log mu over lambda. Okay. And uh, if you want the, the arrows to go, so this means that for me, um, the infrared is when mu is equal to lambda. So the infrared, when mu is equal to lambda, t is equal to zero. Uh, the UV is when uh, mu is equal to infinity, t is equal to infinity. Okay, so my arrows go from the infrared to the UV. Mm -hmm. While we said that the convention is arrows go the other direction. So if I want to do it, respect the convention, I have to put a minus sign. Mm -hmm. To put a minus sign uh, yeah, you do. here. Yeah, I think it's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't you know, see. Ah, no, okay. Then I did correct it. Ah, right. You can see, but you do flew from the Gaussian to the. Uh, yeah, let me see. The, the, the non, uh, 
Oh, I, I think that I tried, but then right. I made an I But, but it's just most no, I, I, I think you're, sorry, you're, you're right, you're right. You, yeah, you, you should have managed this. It's, it's the opposite of the one on the paper, because this go from the infrared to the UV. But, uh, right. Yes, yes, right, you're right. You go from the infrared to the UV, because yeah, I, it allows the, the, uh, the yeah. space probe that goes yes. through the non mm -hmm. Okay. You just have to click the, yeah, yeah. the other. So let's draw it here. So basically, you see that we have a line that, okay, like this. And then the flows. As you notice it, the flow is very, fa is very fast because one eigenvalue is much bigger than the other one. No? So then we have like this. And then we have something like this. And this goes. Okay, and this one goes from the UV, so this is the UV, and this is the infrared. So remember that the concept of being UV or infrared is the property of a trajectory. A fixed point is neither UV or infrared, okay? It could be a fixed point that has direction, which are asymptotically safe, though all those who belong to the UV critical surface of that fixed point. But in general, and it's a, it's a trajectory which corresponds to the quantization. This is my microscopic action and this is my physics, okay? So it's a trajectory that corresponds to a path integral. So by studying the problem of, first by going upside down, I first study all theories, then find those fixed points I can use for doing the continuum limit. Then I can construct the trajectory. So then I construct the path integral. So with respect to the standard way of thinking that you start from a path integral, then you run into trouble, and then you try to understand why there is trouble, the trouble was simply because you didn't have a fixed point to start with, because you always, for example, were starting from the Gaussian fixed point. Okay, so now we have this trajectory here, okay, along which <coughs> we, uh, so this is the V critical surface of the non Gaussian fixed point, okay? Because if I am somewhere here and I want to go to arbitrary high energy, the theory doesn't blow up. The amplitudes I compute, if I stay here, they don't blow up. Okay? And then it's very important because, as you see, I can, since this is a, fi a cure, I can see this point, this manifold here, as a function as a result, of alpha j. Okay. So now you see that this coupling that before was independent, now it's dependent. So it means that this is the only data I have to take from experiment as a certain scale to obtain the other coupling. Okay? If now this thing goes on in all the other direction, it means that I have to just to fix one number. Okay? This is my asymptotically safe theory. Here I get my coupling alpha j at the scale of my experiment. I plug it inside, and then I get alpha y at the scale uh, mu prime. I get alpha u the scale uh, mu prime. And obviously also alpha j at the scale mu prime. Okay. So these are my prediction, and this is my the, the data I have to insert in the theory. If you look at theory as a computational machine for making predictions, right? What does it mean for the theory to be asymptotically safe? It means that it's, it's able to make prediction at energy mu prime, which are much bigger than mu. Okay? Because if I am just concerned in making prediction at the energy mu, which are bigger than mu, then I can use effective field theory. Because I know that if I consider enough operators, Okay, I can just do loops with them. But if I want to have a theory which I want to have go out energy arbitrary far away, the only way to have this is to have a symbolic safety or a non trivial fixed point. That's the reason why we consider these theories as fundamental. Okay. And um, Yeah, I think that uh, this is more or less now. Okay. Um, 
then you just have to imagine, let's draw a last picture, so, so now imagine that we have many more couplings, okay? So in this case, I will have my surface, the UV critical surface with the fixed point here, okay? And uh, this fixed point will, have, for example, uh, be like this in this direction, but uh, like this in this direction, and for example, in this direction, okay? So if I take a point around here, okay, then this one will identify a trajectory that will go down to the infrared, okay? And you see, the only thing I will have to fix is the coordinate. This point will be, for example, with this order coordinates. So alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. In this case, the point on, on this trajectory will be, let's say, alpha 1, alpha 2, and then we'll have alpha 3 as a function of alpha 1 and alpha 2. Right. So this is an asymptotically safe theory with two fundamental parameters that I have to measure, but the other one they will all be given. Okay. So even if this theory is not is not normalizable in the perturbative sense, because if, if you try to describe this theory starting from the Gaussian fixed point, then you will have a lot of infinitely many operators because the fundamental action is non-interacting. So every time you do a loop, you generate an operator that wants to be there because to close this action, you have you need infinitely many operators. No? But still, I will be able to be do, to, to have fundamental theory, able to make prediction at arbitrary high energy but with eating only a finite number of inputs from experiments, if I have this setting. So now, uh, the next step that you do there in the paper is to consider also the other two directions, u and v, and just repeat the analysis. But in this case, it turns out to be consistent with what we did. So this is something you can uh, work out by yourself, and then uh, let's see. This order. These are the let's say the, the main things. Then the other things are obviously. If that picture, for some reason, that picture was all we needed to describe, like if that was a uh, completely a faithful representation of the theory space, just we took up it for some reason, then this will be a complete description. And we'll have. But obviously we are never so lucky. And, uh, so then all the, the things that you have to check is that if your uh, system is consistent and already implying or using the by consistency condition is a good step forward, then you do the stability. So you ask, for example, how quantity which are Physical and the critical exponent depends when you change, you go from the leading order to the next leading order and things like this. And then, uh, then, okay, yeah, then, uh, more, mostly technical questions. Maybe you can discuss, uh, okay. So that's it, this is the introduction to the asymptotic safety. So now when, uh, we will try to do any other project. What, what we will try to do is to see if we can find out other examples of asymptotically safe theories. Obviously, we will be limited by the fact that we, our tool is, in this case, perturbation theory, plus by consistency condition, plus the Venetian limit. But if we can find them within, the, within this uh, subset, then we can consider that they are like, somehow guaranteed, because we are quite confident they can be there. Jonathan, you said something about the 